Okay. So, uh, Roman, I'll let you introduce yourself and take it away. Uh, I think it's a bit too late for me to introduce myself. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, I, welcome back. I, this is going to be a workshop in two parts. And the first part is going to be probably significantly bigger than the second. So we're going to run through the break. Uh, and then maybe we're going to have about uh, 30 minutes left in the end. And I'm going to spend the rest of it talking about NASA ADS. But the first part is about version control and specifically uh, two amazing software packages or rather a software package and a web service called Git uh, and GitHub. They're not the same thing, but they are related and we'll see how. And I don't think there's a single human being on earth who hasn't uh, ran into a GitHub repository at some point in their life. Uh, especially those enrolled in this program would have definitely, hopefully, looked at Splat and the like. Uh, but there, there is a very big gap between just using GitHub as a file storage and uh, actually mastering version control. So this is going to be a very basic introduction to the subject because it's incredibly, uh, infinitely deep. And primarily that's because I don't fully understand it myself, uh, but hopefully you'll be able to take something out of it. Anyhow, let's just jump right into it. Uh, and the first question that people usually ask is what on earth is version control? So if you, if you go on the internet, you'll be able to find a whole bunch of memes related to uh, Git and GitHub sometimes, and none of them are terribly funny, but they do give you a pretty good idea of how much you understand the subject. So this is going to be a test. So those of you who have never used Git before, this would make no sense whatsoever. And now we're going to come back to this slide at the very end. And if you are in the very least able to understand why the person who created those memes thought they were funny, uh, then you're definitely on the right track. So what is version control? Uh, so let's just think about a normal process of developing a software application. All right, so you're going to have a bunch of code, which is represented here with those ones and zeros. And you're going to sit down, you're going to write it, and you're going to call that the very first version of your code. Uh, but it's probably not going to be the last version of your code. Because eventually, you're going to introduce a bunch of additions, you're going to add features, you're going to fix some bugs. Uh, and uh, sometime later, you're going to arrive at an upgraded version of your code. And we can call it version 1.5. And then you'll do that again sometime later. You're going to arrive at a new version of the code and so forth. Uh, and so the process of software development is just you jumping from version to version, gradually improving your software package. Uh, and hopefully, that makes sense. And the most uh, ordinary way of following this workflow uh, is by simply editing everything in the text editor. So you create the first version, then you open it in the text editor, you rewrite the code to create the 1.5 version, then you open the text editor, you override it, and you create the 2.0 version. Uh, and the problem with that is that you only really have access to the latest version of the code, and everything that existed before it just gets erased, and you can never access it again. And the idea behind a version control system is that you create this magic space on your computer called a version repository or repo for short. And you add a software application such as Git that is going to be sitting in your computer and is going to be watching you code. And every time you produce a new version of your code, Git is going to see it uh, and it's going to grab that version. And it's going to store every single version in this magic place called the repository. And so eventually, here you are, you're a developer, and you have your latest version of the code. And then Git has the repository, and it has all the previous versions of the code. So they are not lost. And then you can talk to Git, and you can ask Git to give you any of those versions back. So you could say uh, something like, Git, give me version 1.5. And then Git would give you version 1.5. And then when you're done looking at this older version, you could ask Git to give you the latest version. We'll give you the latest version, which is what you had originally. So this is a very, very brief explanation of what version control is. And at this point, most people would ask, why on earth would somebody do such a thing? Uh, and interestingly enough, this uh, is widely believed to be a silly question by more advanced Git users. But it's actually not. I think it's a very good question, because intuitively, what most people think is that the latest version of the code is the best one, unless you're Microsoft, I suppose. But generally, the reason why you create new versions is because you add features and you, you remove bugs. 
So it doesn't make sense why you would want access to the previous inferior versions of the code. And so before we jump into using Git, I would like to uh, go over a few reasons why you might want to have a version control system in place. Because I think that understanding why using Git is necessary is probably the biggest part of the learning curve. Uh, and I sorted them in the order of decreasing priority. And I'm going to start with the, the reason to use Git. That's, in my opinion, the least important one. And you can use it just for documentation. So because you have every single version, you can track down where different changes in your code came from. So if you look at your code and you see a weird line and you don't understand the purpose of that line, then normally there will be no way for you to figure out where that line came from, especially it was added by somebody else many years ago. Uh, but in the case of a version control system, all you need to do is just say, like, Git, uh, why do I have this line of code? Uh, and Git would be able to search through the entire repository of versions and tell you when that line was added, what version that line was in, who added that line, and it might also force a description of every single revision, in which case it would be able to provide some justification for why that line is there. And this is actually really easy to do, and I will show you how to do it. This is probably the least important feature of Git. It's called Git Blade. So this is reason number five, the ease of documentation. And now we're moving on to a slightly more important reason. So here's reason number four. Uh, suppose that you have a feature in your code that you use once a year, and then you used it last year and it worked perfectly, and then you use it this year and it doesn't work anymore. And you've had maybe a dozen versions between the old version that worked and the new version that doesn't. So under normal circumstances, you would have to go down the rabbit hole and just debug the entire thing, trying to figure out which of the million changes that you introduced during that year caused this thing to break. Uh, but with a version control system, things get much easier. You would just uh, cycle through all the versions stored in the repository from the version that you know works to the version that you know does not. And you would look for the revision that introduced this bug. And we're not going to talk about this feature much, but there actually is a way to tell Git to cycle through uh, consecutive versions until you find a specific behavior. Uh, so moving up the chain, uh, reason number three uh, is the ease of distribution. Uh, so suppose that you're a developer and you have some software package that is very useful to other people. So this could be Adam and this could be Splat. And there are lots of other people who want to use Splat. Uh, so in the old days, the way you would do this is either by emailing those people or by giving them a USB stick or creating a website. And then when you produce a new version, you have to go through the whole process all over again. Uh, but with version control, you don't have to do any of that. Instead of giving those people the code, you introduce them to your friend Git. And once those people have access to the repository, all they need to do is just ask Git to give them the latest version from the repository. And as you keep updating your software, they can do that again. And if at some point they run into a version that they really do not like, for example, somebody releases a really bad update, I don't know, this is Windows Vista, uh, then they can always ask Git to give them an older version and there is no issue with that. And most importantly, you as a developer are not involved in distribution at all. Git is doing all the distribution for you. All you're doing is just continuing your development and adding new versions to Git to be added to the repository. Now, reason number two is the ease of synchronization, which is a reason that's very important to me. So suppose that you have two different uh, devices that you would like to work on a project from. Suppose that you have a desktop machine and a laptop. And you have the same code on both devices. And sometimes you work on one device when you're at home, and sometimes you work on the other device when you're traveling or when you're in the office and the like. Uh, so in the, in the old days, the code would migrate from one device to the other via a USB stick. So you would just write all the changes onto it, and you would just carry that USB stick with you, or you would email it to yourself. And at some point, inevitably, you're going to get lost, and then the two versions of the code are going to diverge. And you're going to have some features in one version, other features in the other version, having no clue how to join the two versions together. Uh, with a version control system, this is really easy. You just hook them up to the same Git. And when you want to work on the code from your laptop, you just ask Git to give uh, the latest version. And then you finish all your work, and you tell Git that you're all done. And then Git is going to save the new version. 
And then when you get home and you power up your desktop, you can just ask Git to give you the latest version and you would immediately inherit all your changes and things get much, much easier. And finally, oh, by the way, <laughs> uh, the reason why I use it so often is because this is how I keep, for example, my local computer synchronized with a supercomputer. Right, so I have some codes that I develop on my local computer and then I run it on the supercomputer. And the way I keep the two versions in sync is with Git. And this is also how telescope control hardware works. So anytime when you need multiple uh, development environments that need to be in sync, Git is a perfect tool to do that. And finally, reason number one, and the biggest reason why people invented Git and why they use Git, uh, and that's its ability to encourage collaboration. So here's the idea, right? So you have two different developers and they are working on the same code. So they have the same version of the code and the workflow is incredibly easy. Right? So whenever one of the developers has a new version, all they say, all they do is they just tell Git that they have that version and then that Git accepts it and it adds it to the repository and it can do this with multiple developers. Uh, and then at the end of the day, Git is going to merge all of those versions together uh, and eventually those developers will be able to just get the latest version with the changes from all the other developers. And so there's no reason to worry about code moving the range because all you do is just push your changes to the repository and pull changes of other people from the repository. Uh, now, in some cases, you might have two developers that introduce changes that actually contradict each other. Somebody might set a variable to two, somebody else might set a variable to three. And when that happens, uh, Git is going to issue a merge conflict and it won't accept that change until you resolve the conflict. And then you just cry, this is the worst thing that can possibly happen. We're going to deal with a few of those a little bit later. You could also introduce a hierarchy in your development. So you could have a junior developer, this tiny person here, and a senior developer, this massive person here. And then the junior developer might create a new version uh, and then Git would take that version. And then the uh, senior developer would pull that version and they would check that it worked correctly. And if it does, then they would approve that version to be added to the main release. And then everybody just pulls the latest version and everybody has the latest version of the code. Okay, and finally, uh, on top of those five primary reasons, there are also two very practical reasons. Uh, there is another reason why you need to use Git is because it will be very useful in this program. If you're gonna be working with Splat, you will be using Git. If you end up working on my project with uh, population three stellar atmosphere modeling, you will be using Git. And most importantly, if you ever find yourself working in industry on anything that's even tangentially related to software development, I can guarantee that you will be using version control. In fact, if you're being interviewed by a company for a job and they don't use version control, you should just get up and leave because no matter how much they're going to pay you, it's never going to buy back all the hair that you're going to lose maintaining on version code. Okay, uh, so I'm going to take maybe a 10, 20 second break in case we have any questions about the motivation behind this thing. And then we're going to jump into the command line and see how it works in practice. Um, I'm going to do a quick poll question for everyone. How many of you, by show of your digital hands, have used Git or GitHub before? OK, so. Uh, four, including Dino, and probably including myself and, and Roman. All right. All right, good. So uh, this is going to be new for a lot of you. That's great. OK. Uh, so by now, I would hope that we all have a terminal environment that uh, supports Unix-like commands. So if you are on a Mac, you can just open your regular terminal, and everything should hopefully work. Uh, I don't have a Mac, so I never tested this, but I was told that everything should just work. Uh, if you have a Linux, it should be the exact same thing. I have a Linux here. And if you have Windows, then uh, presumably by now you have installed a Unix-like environment on top of your native Windows environment. Uh, so specifically, we're going to need two applications. We're going to need Git and we're going to need Python. And the easiest way to check that they work is just by typing Git hyphen hyphen version uh, to get the version of Git. And if that doesn't crash, then Git is uh, online. And you can do the same thing with Python. Uh, and so I guess at this point, I'm going to just take a very short break uh, just to make sure that everybody is at this point.
Uh, and if you're not and if you have a minor issue, we can troubleshoot it real quick. Uh, and if not, it's also okay to just watch me do things and then follow the notes that are posted on GitHub uh, on your own later. So maybe 10 seconds. Uh, I'm just gonna check, check the chat. Uh, doesn't matter what version you have. I'm not going to do anything that's fancy enough to be version dependent. Uh, no. Yeah, so uh, Carlos just pointed out that for him, he had to use Python 3 instead oh, of Python. Yeah. Okay, so in that case, yeah, please be sure to replace Python with Python 3. Yeah, that really depends on your installation. Okay, so hopefully we have both of those things working. And first of all, I would like to set up a few settings because for most of you, apparently this is going to be the first time that you're using Git. Uh, and uh, specifically we need to give Git our name and you can copy the command from the notes or you can just watch me type it in. It's not terribly interesting. But basically what I'm saying is that Git change config, uh, change that globally for everything. And specifically I'm changing the property called user.name. And this is going to be my name. I'm just going to call myself Roman. Uh, and then we need to provide our email, which is the exact same syntax, except the parameter is user.email. And my email is going to be omg at gcsd.edu. Uh, and the last change that I really like doing, that's not strictly speaking necessary, but I think a lot of you could benefit from it, I certainly did, uh, is changing the default text editor. So the property here is core editor. Uh, and the, the reason for that uh, is because by default, Git is going to try and use a text editor called Vim. Uh, and a lot of people find it incredibly hard to use, especially if you have no command line experience. So we're changing it to a different code editor called Nano that is just infinitely more straightforward, at least in my opinion. So that's uh, as far as all the settings go. Uh, and now we're going to pause with Git for a little bit. And I would like to just talk about very, very basic command line syntax. Uh, so at any point when we're doing any work in the command line, there's going to be a special directory that is called the working directory, which is basically the directory where we're doing the work. And I think Adam briefly covered this uh, in one of the previous workshops, but I'm just going to very briefly review that. So if you type PWD, which stands for print working directory, you're going to get to the full path of the current working directory, which on my Linux setup is slash home slash Roman, on Mac there's probably a slash user slash something, whatever. Uh, but it's going to be something similar to this. Chat. Oh, nope, I'm just I'm just uh, adding okay. some text. You're good. Okay. Yeah, fantastic. Uh, also, if you want to list all the files that are in the current working directory, the command for that is ls. And I get a whole bunch of files. If you're doing this on Windows Ubuntu, you're just not going to get any output at all because your home directory is probably empty. Uh, in which case you can try uh, doing ls space forward slash, which is going to list the root directory instead of the current directory, just so that you see what that looks like. Now, this only gives you the names of the files. If you want to get more details, then the command for that is ls, and then you use a special flag hyphen l, which stands for uh, long, I think. And this is also giving you the list of files, except now, in addition to file names in the rightmost column, you're also getting the date of last access, the file size in bytes. Uh, by the way, when it comes to directories, so all of those are directories, this is not the size of the content of the directory. Uh, this is just the size of the directory itself, which will depend on the file system settings. Uh, now, ignore all of that. Uh, the first character is very important because it tells you whether this, this item is a directory, in which case it's a letter D, or it's a file, in which case it's just going to be a hyphen. Uh, okay, so this is our current directory. And what we can do now is we can try and experiment with it. So for example, I could create a brand new file uh, with the touch command, and then I can give that file some name. So for example, my file dot DAT. Uh, and if I run that, and then I do an ls again, then that file is going to appear right here. And if I do ls hyphen L, I am going to see the size of that file, which should be exactly zero because that file is empty. I just created it. You can also create a new directory, and the command for that is mkdir, uh, literally make directory, and then the name of the directory, for example, my directory. And then if I do alas, it's going to appear right here. I can change my current directory into my new directory. So the command for that is cd for change directory, and then the name of the directory. 
And if I do that and I type PWD, then you would say that the, my, my current directory is not just uh, slash home slash Roman, which is what it used to be, but it's also my directory at the end. Uh, and I can go back and I can see the one level higher with this double dot notation. So that just means go to the parent directory. And so this is something that I suppose you just gain with experience and it just becomes second nature. I would imagine a lot of people are used to doing this in the graphical interface, but you can do a lot of things much faster in the command line interface. We can also remove the files and directories that we just created. So the command for that is rm. So I'm going to remove my file dot dat first. Uh, and if you try to remove the directory the same way, it's going to complain uh, because you need to add hyphen R flag for a cursor in order to be able to remove a directory. So all of those are no good. Uh, so finally, before proceeding, I would like to uh, also point out another special flag uh, of the ls command, which is hyphen A. And what that flag is going to do is it's going to display hidden files in the system. So there are files whose names begin with a period like this .java or .jupyter. And those files are hidden because uh, they would not be displayed if you run ls normally. So in order to see those files, you need to use hyphen a. And I'm emphasizing this because the entirety of Git works through hidden files. Okay, so this is as far as I just wanted to very briefly review uh, Unix uh, file navigation, I suppose. Uh, and now let's try and use actual version control. So let's uh, create a blank project, and we're going to need a blank directory for it. Sorry, Roman, I'm going to pause you for a second, because that was a lot of line commands very quickly. Um, so I want to make sure we pause to see if there's any questions. And I also put a link to Roman's um, PDF document that describes some of this. So you, the things that he just showed um, are listed in sort of the first few pages of that. Um, yeah, it's actually listed in way more detail than it is here. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I can I can try and slow down. <laughs> yeah, it was a lot really quickly. So are there any questions about anything that Roman just did? We've used some of these commands, by the way, already when you're using the reduction, when you CD into your reduction folder, stuff like that. So those are the same commands. Um, but Roman's showing a few more of the options attached to those commands. So are there any questions about, about any of that? Okay, I'm just going to assume everybody's completely lost. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay, uh, so slowing down a little bit. Oh, hold on a second, we got a few questions in here. Oh, okay, sorry, go ahead. Uh, so Eduardo says, when I type ls-ll, get only total zero. So Eduardo, yeah. are you using a Windows machine? Yes, uh, he is, I'm pretty sure. Uh, yes. Yeah, so on Windows, as it so happens, if you use the Ubuntu application that I ask people to install, the uh, the home directory has nothing. Uh, so instead of that, try running ls forward slash hyphen l. Uh, that would list the root directory instead of the home directory just to see how it works. Okay, yeah, no worries. Uh, we are going to be creating files that are going to appear. Okay, so I would like to create a new project uh, and I'm going to create a new folder for it and we'll try and enable version control for that project. So I will use the make dear command just to create a new folder and I'm going to call this folder my project. Uh, and then I'm going to cd into that folder. I'm going to change my current directory. Uh, and if I type pwd, it's going to tell me that I'm in that folder. Uh, so, so far, uh, so good. Not much is happening. And now we're going to start doing magic. Uh, we're going to get Git, and we're going to tell Git to create a repository for this folder. And the command for that is very simple. It's just git init for git initialize. And I can run that, uh, and it's going to tell me that it has initialized an empty git repository. Now, if you type ls, you're not going to say anything in this directory, but this is because git uses hidden files. So if you do ls hyphen a instead, you're going to see this new folder called .git. And in fact, all the versions are going to be stored there. Uh, and uh, if the lock is with us, we're never going to look in that folder. <laughs> Git is going to manage it uh, itself. And we're only going to touch it at a very high level. So now we have created a repository. Uh, so let's add some code to this project. 
So for example, we could create a blank file and I will use the touch command that does that. And I'm going to call this file hello, just to be consistent with my notes, hello world.py. And I'm going to put some Python code in that file in a second. But for now, I'm just going to run this. And if I double it up with ls, I'm going to see that file. Right, now let's put some Python code in it. And for that, we're going to need a text editor. And there is a million different text editors. I'm sure you have your favorite ones. The one that works in the command line and I find easiest to use is nano. So we just type nano and then the file that we want to edit, which in this case is hello world. And by the way, the magic that I'm doing here is called autocomplete, right? So you don't have to type the entire file name. You can only type the beginning of it. And then if you hit tabulation key, it's going to complete the name for you. So if we run this command, nano is going to open and I can just type arbitrary text in here. So let's type some Python code. Right. Since this file is called hello world, let's just type the easiest Python code I can think of, one that just prints hello world, uh, exclamation mark. It's as simple as that. Uh, in order to save the file, you need to hit control O. Uh, it's right here. So this caret, character means control, uh, right out is control O. It's going to ask us for the file name and it's going to default to hello world.py, which is what we want. So I'm just going to hit enter. Uh, and then I'm going to hit control X to exit, which is this, uh, um, this short hand here, just control X. Uh, and we are coming back out into the terminal. Okay, uh, 10 second, five second pause to make sure that we're all here. Let's check that this file runs. So Python, hello world.py, it just brings hello world. Nothing terribly interesting is happening. Uh, so now I'm going to run this command called git status. And what that command is going to do is it's going to tell us how git sees this directory through its eyes. So let's run this command and see what git sees. So it tells us that we're on branch master and we'll talk about branches in a second. And then it tells us there are no commits yet. And we'll talk about commits in a second. But most importantly, it sees that there is this file called hello world.py and this file is untracked. So that means that that file is not currently being versioned. And the changes that we make to that file are not being added to the repository. This is the default behavior. You have to manually add every single file that you want to version to Git. And we're going to do exactly that. Uh, is that a hand? Uh, yeah. Yes, go ahead. I'm um, sorry. How do you exit from the previous? Control X. Um, okay, it's not working for me. Um, just Control X, right? Okay. Uh, what does it say? Um, nothing. It's just making like a noise. I did like the, the print hello world or whatever, and now I'm trying to exit from it. And it doesn't display any message whatsoever. No. Uh, Natalie, did you put in that nano command? Uh, preferred editor is nano? Yeah. Right. So you're in the editor. Are you able to edit the text? Um, I'm not able to edit the text. So it doesn't respond to your keyboard at all? No. And Delilah just had Ubuntu crash when she tried it. Um, do you want to share your screen since it looks like a couple of folks are having this, uh, uh, this issue? Okay, let's just pause very quickly, I guess. Yeah. Uh, yeah, one sec. It might work now that everybody's going to look at my screen. Of course. I think that's the right screen. Um, so yeah, I misspelled hello world and I'm doing control X. Okay, it worked. Okay, okay that looks like it's working. Yeah, I think I was still in the edit mode and I couldn't get out of. Oh, oh so okay. you need to save first with Control O. Oh well, I already exited. Do I have yeah, to? No, now you're fine. Okay, so let's let's do Python hello world .py. Python hello. Oh. Yeah, you can use autocomplete. You just hit that. Yeah, that's right. Uh, so it looks like you didn't save. Can you do nano hello world .py again? Okay, so the file is empty. So let's let's try that again. Just do print hello world. Nice instincts. 
Okay. And do control O. Enter. And control X. And okay. now do Python hello world again. Oops. Almost. Awesome. Okay. That, that's fixed. And okay. Delilah, were you uh, are you able to uh, go up and running? Because you had another issue as well. I'm um, trying to get back to where we were okay. since it crashed. Um, is Ubuntu not starting? It it is. I'm just uh, oops. here. I can share screen. Okay. I rushed through it and got all the way back to here. Oh, okay, that's fantastic. Yeah, so do control O. And enter. And control X. Okay, thank you. And, okay. You should be you should be good to go. Okay. Great. Fantastic. Looks thank like you. everything just fixed itself. <laughs> Okay, so where we stopped is we discovered that this file is on track. And in order to version it, we need to tell Git to track that file. And the command for that is just git add and then the name of the file. So in this case, hello world.py. So I can run that command. And if I do git status again, the message is going to change. So previously, that file was registered as on track. Uh, and it does not anymore. Now it's green uh, and it is now a file that is going to be committed. And Git recognizes that it's a brand new file because we just created it. So, okay, this is fantastic. Git sees our file. So now it's time for us to create a version, the first version of our application, the first version of our code base and send it to the repository. And uh, in Git, that's what we call making a commit. So all of those different versions, there are commits. And the command for that is just git commit. And when you do a commit, all the files that are marked as to be committed are going to be added to the version that we are creating. And then typically, you're going to use the hyphen M flag and then in quotes, provide some title for this commit for future reference. So for example, we could call it my first commit. Uh, and then if you want, you can actually do the same thing again and you can provide a more detailed description. For example, add it a new Python script. I'm just copying this from my notes that prints hello world. So this is a very good description because somebody looking at it 10 years down the line is going to know exactly why this commit was made. So I'm going to hit return uh, and a new commit has now been created. Okay, uh, so now in order to make things more interesting, I'm going to make a second commit. So first of all, I am going to slightly change our file. So by the way, if I just run git status right now, it's going to tell me that everything is clean. Nothing to commit, working directory clean, fantastic. So let's edit our file again. So I'm going to use nano and I'm going to introduce a change. Instead of hello world, I'm going to say goodbye world. Just introducing some arbitrary change, doesn't really matter what it is. And now save, control O, enter to confirm, control X to exit. Let's do git status again. And now git is telling us that this file has been modified, but it's still red, right? So that means that this change has not been tracked. Uh, and actually the term that we use for files that already exist in the repository, uh, this change is not staged. Right? So it tells you that this change is not staged for commit. So if we ran a commit right now, it would not add this file, add the change in that file to the repository. So we need to do the exact same thing that we did before, git add. And I could just type the name of the file, but there's actually a faster way of doing it. You can just uh, do dot in order to add all the files in the current directory. So that's going to be the exact same thing. And I'm going to run that. And if I do git status, uh, this file is now green uh, and it tells us that this change is going to be committed uh, and this file has been modified. Fantastic. So let's create another commit. Uh, so I'm just going to do the exact same thing we did before, git commit and the title, which is going to be second commit and a description. Uh, let's say changed hello to goodbye. 
Okay. And now we have two different commits. And at this point, uh, we should probably start drawing things because that's going to help us a lot. So let's see if I can switch to the whiteboard. Uh, so I'm going to be drawing with my mouse. It's going to be terrible. I apologize in advance. But we started with a blank folder out here. Then we created our first commit. And that was just where we created this file that prints hello world. And then we added a second commit, which is where instead of hello world, we are doing goodbye world. So this is our current so-called tree. Uh, and this is what we have. So this is very simple so far. Let me switch back to my screen. Uh, in fact, we can see all the commits in the current tree if we do git log. So that's going to display the two commits that we have. This is the first commit, and this is the second commit. Now, commits those uh, have those really, really long names. They're actually hashes. Never mind what that is, just the unique name of this commit. Uh, it tells us the author and the email of the author of that commit, so you can track down who created every change. It tells us the date when the commit was made. It gives us the title and the description. And it also tells us that this commit is the head of the current branch, which means it's the latest commit. Okay, do we have any questions at this point? I have a question, Roman. Sure. Uh, on the nano terminal, how, what was the instruction to get it? She said Control O and then what? Control O to save. Uh, enter to confirm, and then control X to exit. If you try and exit without saving, it's going to ask you if you want the file saved. Yes. I think it was on the same, on the same uh, window that my classmates but OK. Control O, OK. Did you manage to figure it out? More or less, but uh, well, you can keep going. And I'm going to see the record. OK, yeah. I mean, worst case scenario, we can just go over the notes later or in the office hours or the like. All right. OK, so now let's make things even more interesting. So say I want to develop a new feature. For example, in addition to my code printing some line of text, which if I run it right now, it's going to be goodbye world. Let's say I also want my code to do some basic calculation. For example, multiply 2 and 2 to get 4. Now, what I could do, chat question. Yeah, thank you, Bridget. Yeah, it was, yeah, just to sharing the commands. Okay. So, what I could do is I could simply uh, add a third commit, right? So, I could just add a third commit, but that's just boring. Uh, and there's a number of reasons why you would not want to do this. And I'll explain it in a second. So, a better way of doing it, if you're going to work in a new feature, is to create a new branch. Uh, so what that means is that the original branch is just going to keep going and we're going to have a split and we're going to create a commit here. Uh, and then when we're done working on this feature, we're going to merge it back together, but we haven't done this yet. So there is a number of advantages to doing that. Uh, the most important one, people might be using the software package right now, in which case they're going to be asking Git for the latest commit in the main branch for this commit here. And if we have half finished work that hasn't been properly tested or developed, we do not want it to be in the main branch. It's also possible that you have a senior developer who would like to review your changes before they go into the final release, or you just want to keep things organized. Uh, so anyhow, if we do this, we're going to have two different branches. The main branch is called master. This is just the default name. Uh, which most likely is going to change in the subsequent versions of Git uh, because a lot of people are finding it offensive. Uh, most likely it will be changed to either main or primary. In fact, GitHub already has changed. We'll talk about GitHub later. But for now, the default is master. And for this new branch, which is conventionally called feature branch, we can give it any name that we like. Okay, I'm going to check the chat very quickly. Okay, that's all fine. So let's go back to the desktop and let's do just that. All right, so the first thing that we need to do is we need to create a new branch. And the command for that is git checkout and then hyphen b, which means create a new branch, and then the name of the branch. So the name could be anything, but the convention is if you're developing a feature, then the name should be feature slash and then some meaningful name. Uh, in my notes, I use add to m2, and I'm going to use that here. So all I'm telling git here is create a new branch and call it feature add two and two. 
So if I hit return, it's going to tell me that it has switched to this new branch. In fact, we can run git branch to see all the branches that currently exist. And there are two. There is the master branch and there is the feature branch. And the fact that this asterisk is here means that this is the branch that we're currently in. We can also see it if we do git state as the command that we ran before. Uh, so the first line is going to tell us that we are on branch feature at two and two. Okay. So now if we create a commit here, it is not going to go into the main branch. It's going to go into this side branch. So let's do just that. Uh, so let's edit our file again. Nano, uh, hello world. And let's add that new feature. Right, so I'm going to go to the very end. And in addition to printing goodbye world, I'm also going to print uh, the calculation of two plus two. OK. So hopefully, this is going to produce 2 plus 2 equals 4. And so once again, I can save that with Control-O, hit Return, and exit with Control-X. And now, in order to commit this change, I would have to do git add and either the name of the file or to add all the files, just dot. Awesome. And finally, let's commit. So let's do git commit. And then the title of this is going to be third commit. And the description is going to be added a calculation of two plus two and go. And now we have our third commit and this commit exists in this feature branch. So let's see what that looks like. If I do git log, I am going to see three commits, right? The head commit is the third commit and then the second commit and the first one were inherited from the master branch before we diverged. If I run this script with Python hello world, it's going to print both goodbye world and two plus two equals four. I can go to the main branch right now. I can go to the master branch if I wanted to. And the command for that is git checkout. Uh, but we're not going to do hyphen b anymore because that creates a new branch. Instead, we're just going to type the name of the branch. So I can go back to master. So now I'm in master. And if I do git log here, I'm not going to see the third commit. I'm only going to see the first two, because remember that third commit exists in the feature branch. Uh, right? So very briefly, right now I'm on branch master. So I'm seeing this, and I'm not seeing that commit there. And if I try running the script, it is not going to have that 2 plus 2 calculation, because it does not exist in the master branch. And then I can uh, switch back to my feature branch, git checkout. And by the way, autocomplete works here too. So I don't have to type that feature slash whatever. I can just type the A and then hit tabulation. And it's just going to find that branch. And if I do git log here, that third commit is going to reappear. And if I run my code, that 2 plus 2 calculation is going to reappear as well. OK, so now we have two branches. Fantastic. Let's say we're done developing this feature. And now we want to merge this feature branch into the main branch. So to do that is actually really easy. We just need to go back to the master branch, to the main branch. So git checkout master. And then we use a command called git merge and the name of the feature branch. And I'm going to use autocomplete. So the yeah, sure, add two and two. OK. So what this command is going to do is it's going to basically take the third commit from the feature branch and move it into the master branch. So if I run that now, and I do git log, I'm going to see all three commits in the master branch. So here's what happened. Right, so I checked out the master branch. This is the feature branch. And then I ran this merge command. And what happened is that this commit just got moved into the master branch. And now I have two identical branches. They have the exact same commits. And now if somebody is asking for the latest version of the code, they are going to get this latest feature. OK, 10 second pause for questions. Chat. So Natalie has a question. If she accidentally, ex actually exits from my project, what happens? Uh, as in if you switch the directory elsewhere? Um, as in, I think I exited from like my directory altogether. And so um, like the preceding lines are just like sideways, like little carrots instead of like my usual, like Natalie at desktop and then like my project. Oh, that's interesting. Where where exactly are you? What happens if we type PWD? PWD? Um, nothing happens. 
And when I typed in Python, hello world, P PY, nothing happened either. Uh, shall we yeah, just take sorry. a quick pause and have a look at Natalie's screen? Maybe. Yeah, that's probably a good idea. You wanna share your screen, Natalie? Yeah, so, oh, yeah. The, yeah. So oh, um, I made a mistake right here. I didn't put two quotes. Can you just hit control C? Okay. And try again. Oh, yeah. So that brought me back. To it looks work. like you just it typed in a, I mean, you, need to, you need to do the whole command, I think. It looks like you accidentally typed a line break. Okay. Okay. I guess. Or, no, sorry. You, you messed up the quotes. Yeah. Yes. It was a single quote and a second quote. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's okay. Yeah, sorry about that. That happens all the time. All right, thank you. <laughs> okay, uh, so in this case, we consider the easiest case scenario, right? We just had the main branch that was just sitting there and patiently waiting for the feature to finish developing itself, and then we just merge that feature in. Uh, normally, this is not what's going to happen because the branches are going to be changing at the same time. For example, some other developer could be working on some other feature and they might be merging that feature into the master branch, in which case master branch is going to be growing while we are working on this feature. And this is how conflicts arise. And the most important feature of Git is being able to resolve those conflicts. So before we take a break in the next maybe five minutes, I would like to demonstrate an example of that. And then we'll move on to more interesting things. So let me very quickly go back to the whiteboard and explain the strategy of what I'm going to do in a second. So first of all, I would like to unmerge <laughs> this feature branch. So I would like to just remove this commit from the master branch. I just want to go to the master branch and delete the last commit to bring us back to the state before we merged. Uh, so let's do that. Let's go back to the terminal. Uh, so the way you would remove a commit from a branch, first of all, let's make sure that we are in master with git status. And we are indeed, we are on branch master. Uh, and then the command to remove the last commit is git reset. Uh, and then there are two different ways of resetting. There is a hard reset and a soft reset. And we don't really have time to go into the details. Uh, so I'm just going to go for a hard reset, which kills the commit completely. Uh, and then I need to specify how many commits I want to kill. So specifically, I am going to uh, remove the topmost commit. So had caret means shave the current branch by one commit. So just take had and move it one commit back. So if I run that, the last commit is just going to disappear. So if I do git log, there's only going to be two commits here. And if I run my Python script, that added two plus two is going to disappear. Okay, so basically I unmerged my feature branch. It just returned back to where we used to be. So the current state is uh, that. Okay, so we just went back. Hopefully that makes sense. And now let's simulate a conflict. So let's say that the feature branch is going to stay as it is. In fact, let me very quickly go back to the whiteboard. And sorry, Roman, to, we, yeah. sorry, we have a question from Bridget. How do we go back to git master yeah. again? Oh, uh, git checkout master. Yeah, so it's always git checkout and the name of the branch that you're going to. Yeah, that's right. Thank you, Adam. Okay, so now here, I'm gonna use this in the different color. I'm going to create a new commit on master that contradicts this commit here. So let's do that. And let's go back. And I can see Adam's face. <laughs> okay, so let's just edit our script nano hello world and i am just going to i don't know i'm just going to change everything i am going to remove goodbye world and replace it with something like good night world so now if i save this and then i do git add right so just the usual process for committing things and git commit and the message is going to be another third commit and so the description is going to be this commit contradicts with the feature branch third commit. I don't think with is supposed to be there, grammar. And let's commit that. And now we have exactly that, right? So we go back to the drawing board. 
So we have this red commit that is changing this file, and we have the black commit that is changing that file, and they're changing the same file in a different way. So let's see how Git is going to handle that. So first of all, let's make sure that we didn't mess anything up. So if I run Python hello world here, it's going to print good night world. And if I check out my feature branch and run Python hello world there, it's going to print goodbye world and two plus two equals four. Okay, let's try and merge them. So let's go back to master and let's do git merge and the feature branch. So if we did not have a contradiction, it will just move one commit from one branch to another, but you can't do that anymore. So let's see what Git is going to do. Boom, <laughs> auto merging conflict, merge conflict in hello world.py, automatic merge failed, fix conflicts and then commit the result. So this is uh, probably the greatest nightmare of any Git user. Like this is where you just like give up on your life. And <laughs> but fortunately, this is a very, very simple situation and we can resolve this conflict. Uh, so let's have a look at the Python script because Git added a few things for us in there. Let's have a look at it in nano. Uh, that was hello world.py. So this is what this file looks like right now. Uh, let's break it down step by step. So this line here, this line here, and this line here, they were added by Git. What Git is telling us is that there are two different versions of this file and it doesn't know which one is correct. There is this version, that came from the head of the current branch. And there's this version that came from the feature branch. And Git doesn't know how to deal with that. Like they contradict each other. This version wants this and that version wants that. And what Git expects us to do is just to literally add in this file to resolve the conflict. So let's say we want to take the best of both worlds. Let's say we want to keep this line from the master branch and we want to keep that line from the feature branch and we don't need anything else. So let's remove that, we don't need that. And by the way, you can use control K to kill a line in nano. Let's remove that, control K. Let's remove this and let's remove that. Okay, so this is the version of the file that I want. Now the conflict is resolved. And I can save this file, control O and control X. So now that we resolved the conflict, we need to add this file back because it actually fell out. If we do git status, hopefully we're going to see that. Yeah, so it's red again. So what we need to do is just do git add hello world or git add full stop. And then we need to tell git that we're done resolving the conflict. And the command for that is git merge hyphen hyphen continue. That means we're done resolving the conflict and git can now proceed. And let's hit return. Okay. So we got this far, <laughs> and now what Git is going to do is it actually going to do a lot of work for us, and it's going to take the entire feature branch and condense it to a single commit and add it to the master branch. So here's what Git is doing. Let's have a look at the whiteboard one more time. All right, so we had this conflict, and we resolved this conflict, and now Git knows how to add things together. So what it's going to do is it's going to get rid of this. It's going to get rid of that. And it is going to create a new commit that is based on the combination of the two that we just gave it. And this is called a merge commit. Okay. Does that make sense? Any questions? Okay, awesome. Let's go back. Uh, sure. Uh, sorry, does, right, that, right. does that feature branch like no longer exists now. Now there's only the master oh, branch. Sorry, I actually, yeah, I was, I was thinking about that. It's not actually going to change it. Uh, what I meant is like this commit is not going to make it into master, but no, the feature branch will remain unchanged. Yeah. Yeah, so when I crossed it out, I meant it's not going into the, into the master branch. Like neither of the two are going into the master branch. It's like a combination of both is, uh, but it's gonna stay in the feature branch. The feature branch is not changing. So okay. Roman. Uh, Roman, you might answer this later, but uh, since that branch is then kind of hanging out there, is there a way to like chop it off? Uh, yes, but you do not generally want to do that. Uh, you have unlimited storage space, and in general, you're not supposed to be deleting commits. The only reason why I deleted commit five minutes ago is for demonstration purposes. This is actually terrible practice. Uh, yeah, if you want to undo your changes, you create a new commit that removes your changes. Okay. 
So let us switch back to the desktop. Uh, so now Git is trying to create a new commit, uh, and it just asks us to give it a title. That's all is, that's happening here. It opened a text editor, and it's begging us to type in a title. And the default is merge branch feature at two and two, and that's a, that's a good enough name for me. So all I'm going to do is just save this, control O and control X. And that's it, we're merged and the merge conflict is resolved. So we're currently on the master branch. Let's check git status. Yep, we are on master, there's nothing to commit, work directory is clean. And let's have a look at git log. Uh, so this is interesting. So we have a lot of different things. In fact, they don't fit on the screen. I can just uh, press return until I see all of it until the end of the file. Uh, if you have a bigger screen, that's not going to be an issue. So the topmost commit is this merge commit. Uh, and then the one underneath uh, is the third commit from the original branch. And we're going to have a look at them closer. And then this commit does not actually belong to this branch. It belongs to the feature branch. And it's only added into this log so that we saw the description of what's happening for posterity. And then those are the two original commits that we have. OK, so I'm just going to hit Control C. Uh, no, wait, Q. Yeah, so you hit Q to exit out of that. And we're back to the command line. And we can have a look at the individual commits. And the command for that is git diff. Uh, so let me show you what I mean. So I can do this, git diff, and then say hat caret hat. So what I'm telling git here is show me the difference between the hat commit and the commit that's before hat. So basically show me this commit here, the topmost commit. And if you run that, you're going to see that it's adding two plus two equals four. And we can look at the previous commit. We can look at this commit here. And if we do that, so that will be the difference between the second topmost commit and first topmost, sorry, the one that's second from the top and the one that's third from the top, uh, that will be adding the good night world. Uh, and then the two original commits are just the two commits that we had in the beginning. And now if we run Python, uh, our script, that's going to be the correct merge, right? So we have the good night world from the master branch and two plus two equals four from the feature branch. We have merged everything successfully and we have full history of everything that was happening. Okay, I know this is a lot to take. So how about we take a five minute break and I will take any questions about uh, merges and merge conflicts and the like. And after the break, we will be talking about GitHub. Yeah, so before we break there, are there any questions uh, or places that you've gotten stuck? You know, we either lost everybody. No, I'm, I think I think they're still there. <laughs> I, I, I personally would have got lost. <laughs> All right. Well, let's take a let's take a five minute break. We'll come back at five oh five. And um, if you have questions that arise in the meantime, uh, you can either hold on to them till we come back, or you can put them in the chat window and we can answer them when we get back in five minutes. Okay. Sounds good. All right. I'm going to pause recording and then. We have just restarted the recording, so we can okay. we can return. Fantastic. So let us go back to the drawing board and let's draw a few things. Uh, all right, so up to now, <laughs> thanks. Uh, so up to now, uh, all we've been doing was focused on our local computer, right? So we kept the entire repository in our local computer. And if you want to collaborate, unless everybody's using your computer, that's not terribly convenient. Uh, so when we work with multiple people, we use a slightly different architecture. So here's you, uh, it's a very terrible drawing. And this is your local repository managed by Git that has all the versions. Uh, and you might have some other developer here that has their repository. So in order to keep those in sync, what we need is we need a server somewhere in the cloud available to everybody on the internet and there is a name for that. Uh, that's going to be the origin repository. And the idea is that every now and then, whenever those developers add branches and commits, they are going to push 
their results onto this repository that is accessible to everybody. And likewise, they are going to be pulling things from that repository to get access to the work that is done by other people. So uh, this orange person could create a new feature in a new feature branch, and then they would push it onto the origin repository. And then this red person is going to pull it, and then everybody has the same repository. Right, so the central origin repository is going to be the most important chain in this whole link. This is how we all communicate. So what we need now is we need a literal server connected to the internet that can do this. And as it turns out, there is a free service. It used to actually not be free, but they are so incredibly popular that thanks to ad revenue, they are completely free now that would give you that server. And that service is called GitHub. And it's not the only one that's out there. There are competitors, but GitHub is by far the most widely used. And that's why I asked you guys to create an account on GitHub. And so we're going to go and explore that account uh, right now. I'm going to switch to my web browser. Those are, by the way, the notes that you can look at later. And let's go to the front page of GitHub. That's github.com. And you should have an account. And you need to log in if you're not logged in yet. And this is what your front page is going to look like or something similar to that. And now we're going to create a new origin repository. So let's hit this green new button. And uh, it will let you choose a name for your repository. And for now, I'm just going to call it my repo, whatever. You can call it anything. It will ask you to type in a meaningful description a repository to help me learn versioning. And it will also let you choose between a public repository that anybody on the internet can see. For example, the repository where I'm storing those notes is a public repository, and Splat is a public repository. However, people can't edit it still. Even if it's public, they can only see it. Or you can have a private repository, in which case only you and chosen collaborators will be able to see. So because I'm just like messing around and I don't really want the world to see this mess, I'm going to create a private repository. You used to have to pay for those things, but they are free now. We're not going to use any of those things, and we're just going to hit the green Create Repository button. OK, so we've created a new origin repository, and at the moment it is empty. So what we're going to do now is we're going to take the repository that we had locally and we're going to push it onto this origin repository to make it accessible to other developers. And in fact, Git already, sorry, not Git, GitHub prepared uh, a bunch of code that will allow us to do that. So we're interested in this. Push an existing repository from the command line. We have an existing repository. That's what we want to do. So we need to run those commands. And that's exactly what we are going to do. All right, so let's start with the topmost command, and I'm going to explain what they mean as we go. Just going to paste it into the terminal. If you're on Windows Ubuntu, just uh, do right click, I think, and it will paste. So what this is doing is it's adding a new origin for our current repository. All right, so it says git remote, and git remote is just a command that controls remote uh, repositories that are present on other machines. And then it, we're asking git to add an origin and we're telling Git that the address of the origin is this URL here, which is the URL that GitHub gave us. This is just the address of our origin repository on the internet. So this is very straightforward. And I'm just going to hit return. And that's, that's everything that we need to do. Great. Then we're going to look at the second command here. Uh, and this is what I mentioned before. right? So people didn't like the name master being used by default. And in fact, GitHub uses main as the name of the main branch rather than master. And this command simply renames the master branch into a branch called main. So if I run this command and then do git branch to see what branches are available, instead of master and feature branch, as I had before, I have main branch and a feature branch. It doesn't really change anything. It's just a, a change of name. It doesn't change any of the dynamics. And finally, we need to do a push, right? So we need to take all the commits in, that we have in the branch, and we need to push them onto the origin. And we do this with this command here, git push origin uh, main. 
And in fact, you only need to run this command once and then it's going to remember it. And from now on, you will only need to run git push. And we'll see that in a second. But this is the first time that you're running this command. It would have to be like that. And so I can run that. And because this is will be accessing a GitHub server, it is going to ask me for my username and my password. So my GitHub username is Roman hyphen uh, UCSD, and you should be using yours. And my password, I need to look up. <laughs> Hang on a second. Uh, okay. Dun, 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 dun. Making sure I'm not spelling it out as I'm typing it. And that was a successful push. So now if I go back to GitHub, I should be able to see my branch here. Okay, there we go. This is our file, hello world. And so far we only pushed one of the two branches. So the only branch that's available is the main branch. The feature branch is not yet available. We're going to push it in a second. So I'm going to briefly pause here to see if we have any questions about this. And so what we've done now is we created a brand new origin repository. And then we took the main branch, the former master branch, which we renamed it to main branch. We took all of the commits and we pushed them onto the origin repository, creating an identical branch there with identical commits. Okay, 10 seconds. Okay, that looks like we're all good. And now let's try and push the other branch that we have. So the command is going to be exactly the same as before. Uh, so that command was git push u origin main, except I'm going to change the name of the branch from main to the feature branch. I'm going to try and use autocomplete and we can push that as well. And it's going to prompt me for my username and my password, which I have to look up again. I have terrible memory. And return. And it's going to take it a few seconds. And it looks like that worked. So let's go and check, refresh. And we have our feature branch here as well, which has a different version of this file that is slightly older. It has goodbye world instead of goodnight world. And we can switch between those branches in the UI interface provided by GitHub. Chat. OK. That sounds good. Uh, so now let's simulate work being done. Uh, so right now, let's check which branch we're in. Hopefully, we're in the main branch. OK, yeah, we are on branch main. So let's create a dummy commit and see how the whole thing is going to react. And so I'm going to be very quick about it. Uh, let's just create a new file. Touch new file dot that, whatever. I don't really care. I just want to make a change. And then let's add that file to the commit. And then let's commit. So git commit and message is going to be, uh, I guess this is going to be the fourth commit. Uh, and the description is going to be added in the file. OK, so now I have committed it. And I can see it in git log. So the topmost commit is going to be this fourth commit here, I can, I think, hit Q to exit this. Uh, and if we do git status, what you might notice is it's going to tell us that our local branch is ahead of the origin branch by one commit, because we created this fourth commit here, but it does not yet exist on the origin. All right, so this is equivalent to you doing some work, and now you want to share it with the community, right? You want to push it to the origin repository. And all we need to do that is just type git push. So it was more complicated before, right? We used this command here to push. Uh, but you only need to do that once, right? So once you do that once, the association is built and the system knows where the origin is. And you can just type git push, and it's going to push the current branch. And as before, it's going to prompt the username and the password. Ideally, we should be setting up encryption keys. But uh, in the interest of time, we're just typing in username and password. And if I do git status again, it's going to tell me that my branch is up to date with origin. 
Uh, let's also try and simulate the opposite. Let's say that somebody else did the work, right? So a commit was added to the origin that I do not have. And now how do I simulate that? Well, I can just delete the last commit on my local. Uh, go ahead, Rocco. I don't seem to be able to push my feature branch in properly. Could you go over that one more time? Uh, yeah, so the command that I used, I just literally copied it from GitHub. Uh, yeah, so this is git push, which is what we always use to push. Uh, and then I think hyphen u origin just builds an association with the origin. Uh, and then the name of the branch is here. And I use autocomplete to make sure that I'm not mis miskeying it. Don't worry if you can't push it. It's not terribly important because I'm not going to do anything with the feature branch. It was just an example. As long as you can push the master branch or main branch, as it's now called. Rocco, do you want to share your um, your terminal window to see if, if we can? Yeah, we can do that it. as well. Are you able to see it? Yep. So it won't let me uh, auto complete it unfortunately, but I tried typing it out. And we're sure that, uh, can, can he use autocomplete just in case, just to check? If I like go back to add and I press tab, it just doesn't do anything. Okay, so uh, can we see all the branches that you currently have, just type git branch? Yeah, you don't have the feature branch anymore somehow. Oh, awesome. All right. Oh, that's really weird. Not sure how that happened. <laughs> I won't ask any questions. I'll just watch. Oh, I know how that happened. I think you were on the feature branch when you uh, did the sync with the with the origin. Uh, and so your feature branch became main. I, I, I should have mentioned that you were supposed to be on master, because I was on master. That, that yeah. could have been what I happened. Know. Never mind, not terribly important. <laughs> Let's just stay on the main branch from now on, I guess. Uh, yeah, yeah, I think that's what happened. Uh, okay, where was I? So I was trying to delete the last commit. And so what I'm gonna do now is just, we, we already done this before, git reset hard head. That's going to remove that fourth commit. And now if I do git status, what's going to happen is it's gonna tell me that my local branch is behind origin main by one commit. And so what happened is there are four commits on the origin because I just pushed them and then I removed one of the commits kind of imitating somebody else adding a commit to the origin. Roman, just a quick, uh, uh, Zohan has a question asking whether you can show how to switch between branches again. Just go over that again. Yes. So if you just type git branch, it's going to display all the branches that are available. In this case, there are two. There is the main branch and the feature branch. And git checkout plus the name of the branch does the switching. So this takes me to the feature branch. This takes me back to the main branch. OK. OK. Uh, cool. So yeah, going back, uh, so difficult to control the Zoom panels on my screen. Okay, so now I am behind by one commit. And so what I am expected to do is to pull that commit. So it is equivalent, somebody else added a commit to that origin and I wanna pull their changes. So what I do is I just do git pull. It's just as simple as that. And it's going to ask me for my credentials. One more time, type in the username and the password. Uh, and now if I do get status, everything should be up to date. Right, so just uh, checking out one last thing before we move on to the next thing that I want to talk about. And we're very close to the end of this part of the workshop. So we are running out of time. Uh, let me repeat the thing that we did before. Uh, so let me just draw everything in case it's not clear. So I feel like it's not clear even to myself of what's happening. All right, so right now we have the origin and we have the local. And originally, so let's disregard the feature branch. We only have the master branch, let's say, or the main branch. Let's just ignore the, the other one. When we started, it was like that. And we created a blank origin on Git. 
And then we pushed local to remote. And the result of that is we got the origin to look identically to our local. So what I did then is I added a new fourth commit here. So that's equivalent to me doing extra work. And now I need to share it with the community. So I did another push and that commit moved there. All right, so that was the first thing that we did. Then I deleted this commit entirely with git reset. And this kind of imitates somebody else doing work, right? So now I have three commits and it's like somebody else added the fourth commit. And so instead of doing a push, I did a pull. And what that did is it just took this fourth commit and placed it back. So we came back to this situation here where we have four commits and they're all identical. Okay, so this is where we are up to now. So what I'm going to do now is something that is quite interesting. And right? so I'm going to kill this commit again. So I'm going to imitate somebody else doing work on the origin. So let's see what that looks like. And so that's easy. Just git reset hard add one. Great. So now this is what I have. Uh, and what I'm going to do now is I'm going to try and instead of pulling this commit, which is what I'm supposed to be doing, I'm going to try and push. So this is not supposed to work, right? Because my local is no longer compatible with the origin. Somebody else did work on the origin that I do not have. So I should not be able to push. There should be a conflict. So let's see if that's going to work, right? So instead of pulling, which is what I'm expected to do, I'm just going to push. Git push. And I'm going to type my username. And I am going to type my password one more time. U X or A A U. And it is not able to do that. All right. So what it is telling me is that I should be doing git pull before I can push. And now I'm going to do a trick. And instead of running git push, which is just ran before, I'm going to run git push force, which is something I should never do. So what this command does is it basically tells git that I couldn't care less about the work of other people. My local is the only correct version. Just clear the origin entirely and put my work in there and delete everybody else's work. So effectively, what I'm telling it to do right, is just to completely disregard this work done by some other person and just kill the entire thing and just move my three commits there. So this is the absolute worst thing that you can do in a collaborative environment, but this is very illustrative, which is why we're doing it here. So let's try and do that. Git push force. And once again, Roman UCSD and my password. And now it's going to work. It's not going to complain about me needing to pull. And now I just basically made the origin equal to my local, right? So the origin is only going to have three commits now. And I can go to commits to see that. I think commits. Why can't I see it? Code. OK. Commits. There we go. OK. Yeah. And there's only going to be those five. And that fourth commit that we added is just not going to be there because it got removed by the force push. OK, do we have any questions about that? Uh, and I'm going to spend the last five minutes talking about forks and pull requests. And Roman, if we need to spend more time on Git GitHub, it's OK. We can hold. We can uh, do the NASA ADS on another, uh, another day. If, if that's no, we, should, we should be able to fit it. NASA okay. ADS is going to be very brief. Yeah, because I think there isn't really much to say about uh, forks and stuff. OK, uh, so up to now, we've been working with the origin that we own. right? So that origin repository exists under our very own account. Uh, this is not always going to be the case. For example, if you want to get a copy of Splat, that Splat belongs to Adam. It does not belong to us. So we would not be able to just push things into it. It would not allow us to edit it. Uh, we can get a copy of it if we wanted to. Uh, and uh, I'm going to demonstrate this very briefly. So let's just leave this project and go back to our home directory. 
I'm just going to forget about my project. And this just takes me to the home directory one step up. Uh, and in order to get a copy of somebody else's repository on a local, what we need to do is we need to find that repository on GitHub. And in fact, we can just probably search Google for it. Splat Adam Burkasser. And I think the GitHub page is going to show up first. No, surprisingly, it's fourth. And that will give us the address of this GitHub repository, which is just that URL there. And then what we can do is we can just have git clone uh, and the address. And I'm not going to run this because that's going to take ages. <laughs> so instead, I prepared a test repository for all of us, and I have the address right here, and I'm just going to post it in the chat, which is uh, much, much lighter, but does not belong to my main account. It belongs to my secondary account. So chat. Uh, and the address is https hyphen hyphen no slash slash github.com test repo. Okay, so it's currently in the chat and I'm just going to copy it and I'm going to paste it and I'm going to clone it. Uh, and this will be this repository here. All right, so it does not belong to us, it belongs to some other account. Uh, it has the same user profile, but that's not me. That's Roman UCLU as opposed to Roman UCSD. <laughs> uh, so I cloned it. And if I do an LS on my current directory, we're going to see it here. That's that new project. And we can go in and we can run all of the regular Git commands, right? We can do Git status. We can do Git log. We can create new commits. We can create new branches, but you won't be able to push. If you try to push this, uh, GitHub is going to tell you that you do not have access to that repository because it does not belong to you. So the question is, how do you contribute to a repository on the origin that you do not own? And in fact, GitHub provides a way of doing it. And it's called a fork. Yes, that's probably a good idea. <laughs> I'm doing everything in my home directory. No problem. Just giving a little extra bits. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, so the idea behind a fork, and let me just very quickly go to the drawing board, uh, is that there is this repository at the origin that belongs to somebody else. So for example, this is Splat. And what we're going to do is we're going to create a brand new origin repository that belongs to us. And we're going to take all of the commits from here, and we're just going to copy them out here. And this origin will be able to edit however we like, because it belongs to us. And that's really easy to do. You can do it on the GitHub website. Uh, let's very quickly go there. Uh, so let's say we want to fork this repository test repo that belongs to somebody else. Uh, there is a fork button in the top right corner. And that's literally all you need to do. In my case, I need to choose account. You probably won't have to do that. And it's going to guide us to a new repository that is identical to the original repository, except it belongs to us. All right, so this is a brand new repository, except this one is mine. And I can now clone it. Uh, so let me go back up and let me delete uh, this version of test repo that belongs to somebody else. Uh, actually, you need to add uh, for so that it doesn't ask us about deleting special files. And let's clone this fork repository instead of the original repository. So it's going to be clone and then the address of the fork, which is here. All right, so the effect is exactly the same. If I do LS, there's going to be this test repo thing, and I can go into it. So it looks like nothing changed, except now the origin belongs to us. So we actually can make a new commit, and we can push. Uh, so let's do just that very quickly. All right, so let's create a new file, some cosmetic change. I don't really care. New file dot dat. Let's add it to git. Git add new file. Let's commit. And I'm just going to say test commit. And I'm not going to give it a description. Like generally, you're supposed to describe what you're doing, but uh, we're just messing around here, so it doesn't really matter all that much. Uh, and now I will actually be able to push. If I do git push, uh, it is going to push. And it is not going to complain about me not having access because this origin belongs to me. Uh, so once again, username, password, which I lost again. 
bear with me. Uh, dun, dun. It's really tempting to just like spell it out and give everybody my GitHub password. Okay, so we managed to push it. Uh, and this change is now going to be visible here. Uh, so if we look at all the commits uh, on the websites, and that commit should appear. It's right there, test commit here. Uh, but what we should be able to do now is we should be able to alert the original developer that this new commit has been created. Uh, and if they like, they would be able to introduce it into their code. And this is done with the pull request feature, which is basically us telling the developer that uh, actually I think I messed it up. In order for this to work, we should have done it in a new feature branch. <laughs> uh, so let me just do that very quickly. Uh, let us create a new feature branch. Uh, so that's going to be git checkout. Uh, need to check my notes. Yeah, it's lowercase b to create a new branch. And let's just call it feature test. Uh, and let me add another commit here. So let me just create a new file, uh, another new file, a new file to dot that and add it to git and commit another test commit and push. Uh, I need to, I guess, use the original syntax. Okay, this is getting really complicated. <laughs> uh, so that would be the syntax that GitHub originally provided us, which I think, uh, because this is the first time we're pushing this branch, so we can't just use git push. So I think it was uh, something like git push hyphen u and then origin and the name of this feature branch, which is feature test. So that should work. Uh, and then the password. And I'm pretty sure I lost everybody at this point. Uh, but don't worry about that too much uh, as we can uh, go over the notes later. Uh, I'm just sort of demonstrating the idea whilst running out of time. Okay, so that's going to work. And now if we go to the website. Okay, finally, this is what I wanted to say. So it tells us that a new feature branch has been added to this uh, fork repository. Uh, and we can click this green button, compare and pull request to basically send this code as a proposal to the original owner of the repository that we forked. And we're going to have a chance to explain ourselves why that developer is supposed to add that to their code. Like this feature I created is really amazing. Please add. Uh, and then we can hit the create pull request. And now the developer that we forked the original repository from is going to be notified. And if they approve this, uh, this commit will be added to their code base and to their origin, even though we do not own it and we cannot push directly. Yeah, okay. We made it to the end. <laughs> do we have any questions about that? I appreciate that the last part was a mess. Uh, but yeah, so what you should probably do is just carefully step through the notes one more time, because I think that if you guys are going to be editing Splat, then this is how you will be doing it, uh, presumably. Is that right, Adam? Uh, not not quite. We'll, we, we actually do it a little bit more um, clunky than that, but I think it's good to see these options. So, you know, Roman kind of went through a lot of the core aspects of what you can do with Git and GitHub. Um, you may not use all of these, um, but even if you just do the, you know, getting your repository up to the GitHub site just to have a place to store it. That's a really good practice in terms of both, you know, sharing your coding to other folks, um, working collaboratively, but even just backing up your work is, you know, you're getting all this free space from GitHub, might as well use it uh, to back up your work. So some of the stuff we do, we just do is use it as backup for some of our codes so we don't lose it. Yeah, at least one of those five reasons should apply, plus the two bonus reasons that they listed in the beginning. And backup is also another good reason that I didn't even think of. Okay, so let's uh, check our progress. Uh, so hopefully we understand both of those now. I'm going to give it 10 seconds.
<laughs> chat. Okay. Uh, so now on to the second part of the workshop. Maybe we should take like a two minute break because uh, this is going to be completely unrelated. I think we can do it in 20 minutes. Uh, so maybe let's let's break until 40 past. Uh, well, actually, yeah. So while we're doing it, I just wanted to share one more thing. Um, so, you know, we've seen how to use GitHub mostly around programming sphere. There's actually a lot of other ways you can use GitHub. And one of the things I wanted to share for those of you who, um, uh, Roman, I'm going to steal your screen share for a second. Okay. Um, one of the things that you can do is if you're trying to set up a web page, um, GitHub has a GitHub pages um, project um, where you can set up a very quick web page and update your web page in basically the same kind of process. And again, it's then a web page that lives somewhere else, so you don't have to worry about your computer crashing or something like that and no longer having a web page. Um, but it follows the same kind of practice. So if, for example, you updated something on your web page, but you don't like it, you can always go back to an older commit, which is like going back to an older version of your web page. Um, so this might be another, there's a bunch of different ways of uh, using Git. I know people who, for example, will use GitHub to um, write papers collaboratively because they can you know, do the same kind of versioning where they know so-and-so added this text and so-and-so added this figure and um, the lead author can control it that way. So you know, this is, versioning as a sort of practice is a, is a more general thing that's good to get used to because it allows you to you know, all of the reasons that Ron mentioned allows you to kind of keep track of the changes you're making and work collaboratively with other people. Yeah. Uh, you can actually link it up, I think, with Overleaf uh, and have it version your LaTeX, which is really nice. Yeah, and one more thing I'll show um, that I use a lot, uh, just because I'm a more GUI-minded person, is there's also a... Uh, I would I say actually pretty particularly helpful little GUI called GitHub Desktop. Um, and so this allows you to do a lot of the committing um, and pushing and pulling from a basically a GUI based uh, system. Um, so, you know, if you don't want to get into the, like the core details of what commands to type in, this is a good way to maybe get around that as well. And we'll have links for these uh, up on the, um, on the website. The, the problem with that thing is that the moment it runs into anything that's like remotely more complicated than the most basic thing, it just says, I give up and opens the terminal window. That is true. So, <laughs> so if you're an expert like Roman, this is not a good tool, but if you're a beginner like me, it's perfect. Yeah, I think I think it's important to to be able to navigate it in the command line and at the very least to be able to troubleshoot the errors that the, that the UI tool gives you should you use the UI tool. But it's really nice because like UI tool can draw those branches that I was trying to draw with a mouse, so like with a tree and different uh, branches and how they merge and diverge and the like. Although I think they removed it from the latest version. So speaking about things getting worse with updates, uh, but there are alternative clients that can still do. Okay, so shall we very quickly talk about NASA ADS? Let's do it. Okay, let's do it. Okay, this is far easier, or maybe far harder. And the, the idea is very simple, like chess. It's like really easy to learn the rules, really hard to master the game. <laughs> okay, uh, so let's talk about literature research, something entirely unrelated. We'll get back to what NASA ADS is uh, in a second. Uh, but this is all of the basic roadmap of how academic publishing works, right? So if you do some academic work, you want it published so that other people could look at it. Uh, and presumably you want to publish it in a journal that is going to, first of all, double check your work. So it's going to assign referees that are going to review it and also journal that has high impact so that a lot of people are going to see it. All right, so you start with, and I know this is really basic for most of you, but just very, very quick revision. And so you start with a manuscript, which is the original text that you write that you want published. And uh, typically, you send that text to the journal, and then the journal assigns referees, and then they go through the so-called peer review. Uh, and you can be going around that loop for a little while, because the referees are going to give you comments. You're supposed to implement that comment, send the update to the journal, or your paper gets rejected, in which case you write a new one. <laughs> or you, you seriously revise the, the old one. Uh, but once the journal is satisfied and all the necessary changes are implemented, the journal passes it to the editor, and then the editor makes your publication look really nice and also comply with the format of the journal. Uh, and then it becomes available to other people, either for free or for a uh, library subscription. Uh, now, because this process takes a very long time, 
Typically, once you're done with a manuscript, you also upload it to some uh, preprint archive uh, to be just available on the internet. And the, the downside of preprints is that they have not yet been peer reviewed and they have not yet been edited. Uh, so this is this is the basic workflow. Uh, now, at the moment, there are about 11 million peer reviewed publications in the field of astronomy. I don't know uh, if anybody knew that number off the top of their head, but that is the current estimate. Uh, and also, the number of those publications has been growing exponentially, which means that the predominant majority were literally made yesterday. Uh, so this is a plot on both the linear and a logarithmic scale. And the reason why the drop is here is just because of the binning, uh, because we're still in the middle of the 20, uh, 2000 to 2015 period. And so in order to be able to make sense of this, you need a really good search engine that is going to find the publications that you actually want to read. And astronomy is a fairly unique field because it has an incredibly amazing search engine called NASA ADS, which stands for Astrophysics Data System. Uh, contrary to what a lot of people think, there's no word abstract in it or the word service. This is the, the official uh, meaning of this acronym. <laughs> uh, and I guess what we should do is just go to NASA ADS and uh, take it for a spin. And then I'm going to have a few exercises, but I think it's easiest to learn by just looking at how it works in practice. Uh, so let's just type it in Google. And usually it is the first thing that is going to show up. And what you're going to get is a deceptively simple looking search bar. And you can pretty much use it as Google. And if you have a topic that you're interested in, you can just search for that topic. So for example, brain, wolf. That's what we're all interested in. And I'm going to hit return. And after a little bit of time, it is going to tell us they found 10,000 publications that have the words brain dwarf either in their titles or in their abstracts in no particular order. And this is way too much, right? So this does not really help it. So we can narrow things down further. Uh, so one of the useful things to do is to add uh, property refereed at the end. And it's actually going to uh, try and help you or to complete those things. And that is going to reduce all the results to only those publications that have been peer reviewed. So for example, all the stuff that have been submitted to preprint service and not published in journals yet, or stuff that has been published in journals that do not do peer review is not going to show up. So we're only going to get things that have been verified for accuracy. And now we came down to 5,000 things, so about half. Uh, still not terribly helpful. Nobody's going to read 5,000 papers, at least not in a short period of time. So we can keep on going. Uh, and we can look for uh, papers uh, that were specifically authored by a leading researcher in the field. And for that, we use the author clause, and then you will typically want to place the last name in the quotes in case it has special characters. But even if it doesn't, that's still a good practice. Now let's type Adam's last name in here. And that's going to limit to all the papers that were co-authored by Adam. And that still doesn't really help. There's 200 papers, and Adam's been busy. So we can restrict this further and only include those papers where Adam is the leading author. And to do that, we'll just add a caret uh, at the beginning of the last name. And hopefully, that's going to narrow things down. And it does by a factor of three, but 60 is still a lot. <laughs> and so what we can do next is we can restrict the year of publication. So let's say we only want to look for publications over the last five years. So let's say from 2016 until 2020. And hopefully that is going to narrow things down even further, which is great. So there are only three publications now. And we can also specify the journal that we want. And the keyword for that is BIPSTAM, and it is immediately uh, given us a suggestion. And each journal has a, a special identifier. And there is a web page that has all of those identifiers. It's in the slides that I'm going to post. But if we want to, for example, see all the stuff that's been published in the uh, Astrophysical Journal, the identifier, the so-called BIPS time is FJ. And that's going to restrict the results to only two. Uh, and hopefully, this is doable. And somebody can potentially read this in a short period of time. OK, so this is the basic workflow of NASA ADS. And this is how you're finding things. Uh, do we have any questions about this? Because uh, the next thing I want to do is actually look into the uh, entries that we find. 10 seconds. I'm going to have a slide with a summary.
I'm not making this up. I tested all of this, obviously. I'm just pretending like I'm improvising. OK, so let's open this paper and see what's inside. All right, so first of all, we're going to get all the authors. And Adam is going to be first, because that's what we're looking for. We're going to get the title, and we're going to get the abstract, which is fantastic. And in the top right corner, we are going to get links to, first of all, the publisher's web page corresponding to this paper. So let's open it up and have a look. And hopefully, that's going to open the AppJ paper. There we go, the Astrophysical Journal. That's exactly what we wanted. We can access the PDF of the article here. Fantastic. Uh, and you might notice that there is also the archive preprint. Uh, right? So I was talking about preprints before. And presumably, Adam updated the preprint after the publication. So it is, no, you haven't? OK, so. So, that, so technically, uh, technically, we cannot uh, publish, publish after, after it's been published. published. Oh, I've been always updating my preprints. So as long as you do it before it actually shows up in the journal, you're OK. Ah, OK. <laughs> I won't tell you. <laughs> okay. Uh, so let's let's have a look at some of the other things. All right. So those are the links uh, that we can access the actual paper. Uh, so those are all the citations. So those are all the works that are citing this paper. And we could perhaps open some arbitrary paper and actually double check that this is indeed the case. All right. So let's see. Can we access the PDF? Fantastic. And if we search for Burgasser, it's going to show up hopefully. I guess let's get. Maybe it doesn't. Oh, paywall. Ah, oh, God. So yeah, in order to uh, be able to access articles that they actually want you to pay money for, you need to connect through the Campus VPN, which I think I can do. Uh, I think there's. I think there's, I think there's, I think there's an there's archive. An archive. Oh yeah, there's an archive. Okay, there's an easier way, I guess. So let's look at the archive version. Okay. Yeah. So the archive is free. Yeah, but in general, uh, if the, the journal wants you to, to pay to access the article, you would have to use the university library subscription. So you would need to either be connected to campus network or you would use the VPN. And when I search, uh, OK, so there's probably going to be multiple citations, but hopefully one of them is the paper that we saw. Uh, so this is 2014, this is 2016. So chances are this is the, the paper, right? This is uh, 827. And the paper that we were looking at was 827. Yeah, OK, so that's the citation. We'll find it. Chat. Right, OK, that's useful. Uh, then the references tab contains all the papers that this paper is citing, so the other way around. Uh, and there's going to be a whole bunch. So those are all the citations that we find at the end. Uh, and then, uh, Something else that I find particularly useful is the export citation tab, which allows you to, first of all, cite this paper yourself. Uh, and there, there are multiple formats that you can get uh, this thing out of. The default is bibtag. So if you are writing a LaTeX document, you can just insert that in your bibtag file, .bib. And they also provide an IEEE citation, which you can just use in plain text, which is also quite convenient. So if you're typing it in Google Docs or something like that, that is quite handy. OK, there's a whole bunch of other things. Uh, you can access the individual figures. You can look at uh, how this paper was accessed historically. And I'm not going to go to, uh, through any of that, because you guys can explore it on your own. Uh, so what I do want to very quickly go over uh, is a couple of exercises that I came up with. And hopefully, those are going to lead us to uh, linking Simbad and ADS in a second. Uh, so let's ignore that slide. And let's go hunting. So the first task for all of you guys is to find the ADS link to this paper. And in particular, you might have noticed that all ADS papers have the so-called uh, bib code, which is this unique combination of characters that has the year and the journal uh, and the volume number. And, uh, that is supposed to be unique for every publication. And you can identify any publication on NASA ADS through this bib code. So what I want you guys to do is to look for this publication uh, and type in the chat the bib code of this publication. Sorry, can you go back to that last slide? Yes. 
Okay, so let's give that maybe a minute and then I'm going to do it myself. This is, this is really easy. So this is the kind of citation that you find at the end of the paper, right? So if, you, if you're reading a paper and you're trying to look something up and then at the end, you're going to find all the details, right? All the authors and the year and the journal and the volume, the page. Uh, we have an answer. Yep. Give it. Give it a couple of minutes for me, or give it a couple some, okay. some time. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. I have. I think four. So it was spent exactly two minutes on each. That'd be great. <laughs> uh, so let's say until fifty-three. Maybe it's currently fifty-two. Maybe I should go back to this slide. Roman, do you want to show them how to use the, the classic version of the form as well? Because it's a little bit more intuitive. Uh, never use it myself. All right. Do, do you want me to show it real quick? <laughs> uh sure yeah we can try okay. that particularly since Juan has given us an answer so maybe i'll demonstrate how i find the paper using the classic form uh and that will show a different way but so let me uh bring up the okay. screen you want to search for, for the same paper then exactly okay go ahead so um i so if you go to the nest ads there's actually a few different options and what roman was showing was the uh sort of normal modern form that they came up with a few years ago which is this one um, but you can also use a form that they use uh, previously, which is a classic form. And this is a nice way because it separates out the authors and stuff. So for this particular paper, I know the first author is Kona Paki. So remember that you use the little carrot to indicate first author and then the name. And then Roman also mentioned that the date of the paper was 2010. So I'll put that year into the second year. So all the papers up to 2010 should include this paper as well. And if I search on that, then um, it basically just makes that same format string that Roman created, as you can see it up here. And then the first and, paper is- yeah. was We, we also know that it's uh, volume 711. Right, so we can verify that in our volume number. That's what this, or we can click on this, so we can see it in a little bit more uh, text here. So if I scroll down, we can see it's definitely volume 711. Yeah, okay. Fantastic. Okay, we, we solved the easiest one. <laughs> so I think I'm just going to go through the rest myself. Uh, and you guys can uh, practice doing those again uh, later on your own uh, in the interest of time. But number two is a bit more challenging, because now all we get is the last name of the author in the year. And we also get the bit of text in the paper where that reference was mentioned. Okay, so what we have in addition, given a significant fraction of low mass stars and brain dwarfs are found uh, within 20 AU binary systems. Uh, and then there is a bunch of examples uh, of such systems, and one of them is Bergasser 2007, and that's all we get. And because Adam publishes an enormous number of papers, this is incredibly hard, but we can, we can do this. So let's go to NASA ADS and just start from the obvious things. So what do we know? We know that the author is Bergasser, All right? So that's easy. And we also know that Adam is the first author. So carrot, fantastic. We know that the year is 2007, uh, and that's gonna bring up an enormous number of publications, seven. That is a lot, that narrows it down, but not quite. So if we go very quickly back, uh, then we might uh, fish out a few more details. And specifically, you might notice that there is no at all after Adam's name, which means that he's the only author. Uh, and we can exploit that. So if we very quickly go back to the front page of NASA ADS, you actually don't have to remember all the uh, attributes because there is this drop down here that tells you about all the attributes that are there. And specifically, there is this attribute called author count, and it allows us to select by the number of authors in the paper. So I'm just going to copy it from here and I'm going to paste it here. And I know that the author count is one. Uh, so hopefully this narrows things down a little bit more. So now there are only four results. Uh, and we also know that this has something to do with binary stars. Fantastic. So I'm just going to add binary as a keyword. And that narrows things down to only two publications. 
Uh, and this publication is talking about an unresolved binary, which would be the case for something that's less than 20 AU apart. Uh, and so that's the paper. I think it's the other paper. I'm pretty sure it's this one. No, am I wrong? I think it's the other paper. Because this is about one binary. The other one's about binaries in general. OK, let's check. That's not you. Ah, somebody used the exact same words. Wait, this is it. Uh, and this was Burgas for 2007. So it's that one. Uh, and 2007, Bergasser, 134, 1330. 134, 1330. I'm right. I, don't I guess I don't know my own papers anymore. <laughs> don't even for a second think that I'm improvising here. I rehearsed all of this. <laughs> okay, chat. Uh, yes. Uh, so yeah, I'm deliberately making things harder. Yes. So normally you can go to the end of the paper, but sometimes you can't do it if you're dealing with all publications. Okay. Uh, let's see if we can uh, complete the other uh, two challenges. So here's something a bit open-ended. Uh, find an estimate for the hydrogen burning limit for the transition between brain dwarfs and uh, stars. Uh, so that's easy. Actually, this is probably the easiest one of all. Maybe it's a little bit harder than the first one. So let's go back to NASA ADS, wherever it was. And we can just literally search for hydrogen burning limit. And let's see what we find. Uh, so in fact, uh, in order for uh, those words to uh, come in this specific order, right? Because there are lots of papers having the word hydrogen and lots of papers having the word limit. We can put this in quotes and that's going to narrow the results down just a little bit. Actually, I don't think it did. No, it did a little bit. Uh, and then we got 300 papers. Fun. Hmm. Um, I it was a smaller number. I, what if you look up stellar slash substellar transition? Uh, that's kind of a term that I invented myself, so I wouldn't be looking for that. But we could try looking for brain dwarfs. I think that phrase has been used before. Uh, has it? We can, we can add that as well. We can add substellar here. I was hoping that Baraf paper is going to show up, which I swear is what showed up when I tried it myself previously. But for some reason, it isn't. Huh. Does it show up at all? Uh, yeah, the 1997, not the one that I hoped for. Okay, that's not working. Natalia's suggestion is actually a very good one. Uh, which one? Stellar slash substellar transition. Stellar, substellar transition. Okay, let's try that. In quotes or without quotes? In quotes. In quotes, okay. Shall I remove anything else? Yeah, just put that in. Yeah, that happens. That. Okay, let's see. I mean, we're getting closer. <laughs> Nine is a pretty good starting list. And I don't actually see the paper that I was hoping to see. Oh, well, no, I guess I do not. Hmm. That's disappointing. Well, I mean, there's a, a couple of papers toward the bottom. There's one that says mass luminosity relationship and lithium depletion for very low mass stars. We talked about lithium earlier today. And Let's 1997 ANA has evolutionary models for metal poor low mass stars. That's more of your alley, Roman. Uh, so let's see. Burning. No. Boundary. Oh. Oh, this paper is not digitized. You can't search. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah, this, this is just like my life most of the time. OK, anyhow, this almost worked. This is going to be your homework, is to find a good limit. Uh, fun. I just want to very quickly have a look at the last. And that's not going to take more than a minute. Uh, but let's have a look at the very last challenge here. Uh, so here, what I want you guys to do is I want you to find the discovery paper of this particular object. Uh, and the easiest way to do this is actually not by going to NASA ideas directly, but by going to our old friend Simba. 
chat. Thank you. Do you actually know that by heart? No, I just copied it off your screen. Oh, okay. Do you know what that is? I do. Okay. I, I tried to pick a designation that would not give it away, uh, but I guess you do know anyway. Okay, so we can go to basic search and we can search for this designation. Uh, and I think this, this is pronounced TD1, right? That's after the Spanish Observatory. Uh, and we can find all the publications that are related to this object. Uh, we can just go down here and just hit display. And that should show all the publications ordered by date. We're going to start with the most recent ones, but I want the discovery paper. So that's going to be the very first paper that mentions that. Uh, so hopefully this is going to work. That's a lot of publications, but at the very bottom, there is hopefully this 1995 paper. There we go. And that's a nature paper. And if we click on here and then on here, we're going to get to the ADS entry. Uh, and this is, in fact, the discovery of the first brain wolf in 1995. Roman, can I demonstrate an alternative? Yes. So if you go to the classic forum, old school folks like us use, um, there is a field here called object. And this is basically a link to the Sinbad object search. Uh, so if I put that in there and I search, you end up getting the same list of papers. Um, but now, because they're in this interface, you can reverse the order of the dates. So if I flip that around, you get the first papers that mention the source. So it's the same exact same exact result that Roman got, um, but now entirely in the NASA ADS environment. Thank you. I remember how I solved the third challenge originally. Sorry, last 10 seconds before we let you guys go. So I searched for hydrogen burning limit in quotes. Uh, and then what I did after that, and Adam just reminded me, is I sorted it by the number of citations. Citation count. Good idea. And now the first paper that shows up is the Baraf paper that I wanted. This is the 2015 paper that actually gives us the estimate of the uh, stellar substellar boundary. Uh, and that's going to be this actually nice diagram here. Down here. And it tells us that it's 0.07 solar masses. Yeah, that's how I solve challenge number three. Yeah, so you, it's, always, it's always helpful to sort it by citations because then you get the best papers first and the worst papers last. Okay, I'm all done. That was quite a ride. Thank you so much for staying on board. Well, thanks <laughs> Roman for, for doing quite a lot uh, in, uh, in two hours. So I really appreciate your, uh, your preparing those. Um, does anybody have any uh, other questions about either GitHub or NASA ADS? I will say that you'll get a chance to practice with both. Um, and NASA ADS is a real fun uh, to tool to play with if you want to find out the most cited paper, for example. All right, you're getting big ups, Roman. <laughs> Thank you guys so much. I'm going to post the slides, uh, and the notes are already posted. Yeah, and we'll have the recording posted as well. Okay, awesome. Yeah, in that case, I will be seeing you guys tomorrow. Okay, and uh, uh, don't forget that Dino has office hours now. So if you have some questions you want to ask either about the workshop or the reductions or any of the science stuff, uh, please uh, switch over to that channel. Uh, and uh, we'll see you and see everyone later on. Thank you. Oh, Thanks for coming. Rocco has a question. Thanks. One last quick question, Professor.